Okay, this is rolling, rolling, rolling. What I'm doing here is responding to a post on Facebook in the long form, a video, because it started this morning when I woke up, and I know I'm going to end this. It started this morning when I woke up and I read this on the news feed. Not that this much matters, but from a person on my Facebook feed, the Canadian military has become a beacon for violent white nationalists, in brackets, Nazis, spelt with an N, five A's, four Z's, five I's, and an S, for some time. The forces, well, they aren't so into that. At least they say they aren't, and I believe it. But the, li for the list for the past like five years of Nazis joining and getting kicked out of the forces is scary. To be clear, the Proud Boys are neo-Nazis, went to the Canadian military and the Canadian government to carry out white nationalist agenda. Hmm, I wonder, is this possibly a little bit jaded or biased or perhaps even lying outright? I don't know. But more concerning is the steady increase of these angry young men wearing uniforms, shaving their head and hitting the streets as if the two are linked. This is becoming more and more common, become more and more common before it comes less common. Bullshit. And y'all need me to be on the edge of the earth chopping away a bit of farmland. Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, I responded to this. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna ignore everything else. I'm gonna ignore everything else. But this is how I responded first to the posting. Uh, how to lose an argument before it starts. Make clickbait of Nazis as if that proves something. Want a cookie or only a round of applause? And then I, I replied immediately after my first reply. No, but really the funny part of that is that it makes Nazis into a big bad wolf. Uh, always skulking about in the shadows or something to that effect. Something to be feared like the, preven the proverbial vengeance of God. Of course, they're nowhere near that evil, so coordinated nor or, or organized as a religion, I mean. Social justice, on the other hand, big bad work, like a wrestling match. Now I see why Trump uses wrestling memes in a very threatening to everyone, in this, why Trump using threatening or wrestling memes is very threatening to everybody in the civilized world, very threatening when wrestling is the thing, right? Because it's real wrestling. It's not a. It's not a game. It's not even a, a theater. No, 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 no. The work. It's not work. So uh, anyway, this got into me saying, uh, "Warning: Those who use Nazi might get to might start to have to you know provide proof of something like uh, pics or get the fuck out." Or by using a mirror first, i.e., when people yell Nazi a lot, they they might actually have a bit of a problem themselves being a Nazi. Please note, I think Saul Alinsky, then I linked to his Wikipedia page, is more to blame for Nazis here, in quotes, than Goebbels. Because mirrors are good for the old projection muscles, sarcasm. And good morning to everybody. So then I got challenged much later about the... Uh, No, wait, even funnier is not droll and entertaining about making Nazis a great, an object of great fascination and then, uh, you know, an Orwellian fail with a tag. I, I kept throwing stuff at it. I should probably just take a... Uh, I'll probably provide a link. I don't, know, I don't know if I can provide a link or maybe I'll screen cap this afterwards so it's not really worth doing. The whole point of this fucking ramble that I'm getting on with now is one person jumped up to support the original poster and challenged me to provide proof of where in Saul Alinsky's rules for radicals this guy is, was told to project the faults of others onto, uh, onto the enemy so uh, of course perhaps Keith knows right now he's got to double down for the sake of uh, Keith uh, Saul Alinsky is more I can no longer take you ser seriously as a rational interlocutor because I said that Saul Alinsky was more to blame for Nazis than Goebbels and in a way he is uh, it's not because he started the party the Nazi party it's not because he organized it it's not because he was in Germany it's, he's to blame for telling radicals to project their own faults onto others I wasn't looking for supporters Keith I'm only telling you the truth as I see it but of course perhaps Keith knows right now he's got to double down for the sake of public uneducation uh, provide a citation, please. So then I, I started off by linking Wikipedia's uh, synopsis of Rules for Radicals, which, it happens, synopsizes a single chapter of the book to give a, a concise listing of what those actual rules are. It's found in chapter tactics. It doesn't have a number. It's just the, the, the chapter tactics. So we'll, we'll start from the chapter tactics, just, just so we can be nice and clear about how this is going to break down. The chapter of tactics, hmm. 
Let me just double check this. Where where does the chapter of tactics begin? Hmm. Well, let's see. Because I've already read this once today. I'm taking my notes there, but I'll get to the notes in a minute. Yeah, 125 in the particular. I should also note that this, or uh, tell you, that this, when this book was printed was the early 1970s. So things have changed to some degree. Tactics. Tactics means that the chapter on tactics first begins by giving an elementary illustration of tactics. Take parts of your face as the points of reference. The eyes, your ears, your nose, and don't forget the throat. I know Alinsky doesn't forget the throat. First, the eyes. You have organized mass, uh, vast mass-based people organization. You can pray it visibly before the enemy and openly show power. Uh, second, the ears. If your organization is small in numbers, then you do what Gideon did. Uh, one of Alinsky's lovely traits is to continually use biblical references as if that was some kind of proof. Conceal the numbers in the dark, but raise a din and clamor that will make the listener believe that your organization is many more people than it actually does. Third, the nose. If your organization is too tight, even for the, no for the noise, stink up the place. Then, of course, the fourth is go for the throat once you've got them distracted. I always remember the first rule of power tactics, because the synopsis in Wikipedia that I linked from is all about power tactics specifically. Power is not only what you have, but what the enemy thinks you have. This is the very first rule of Alinsky. If I don't have to go any farther in this goddamn video than this, as in, in essence, but I'm going to be going farther simply because I've done the work on it already, I have to go no farther than this first rule. But there's really good proof in the other ones too. Uh, the first rule has a footnote attached to it. Power has always derived from two main sources, money and people. This first line I immediately scribbled into the margins here no no and then a little arrow going down that says property does not equal money and then i labeled this education because that's exactly what it is lacking money the have-nots must build power from their own flesh and blood mass movement expresses itself with mass tactics hmm Having the finesse and sophistication of these status quo, mass tactics, you mean like linking together and forming a huge unified group like fascists do? Oh. Having the finesse and sophistication of the status quo, the have nots have always had their club, had the club this way. In early Renaissance Italy, this is a very interesting point. I actually came to this one many, many years ago, long before I ever read this piece of crap. Uh, the playing card showed swords for the nobility. The word spade is a corruption of the Italian word for swords. Chalices, which became hearts for the clergy, diamonds for the merchants, and clubs as a symbol of the peasants. This is why the Ace of Hearts is the Holy Grail. This, this is truth. Uh, I call them cups, not chalices. I call uh, swords tongues, not swords. I call clubs oars, not clubs. And I call coins, well, coins, diamonds. So that's the first rule, anyhow. Second rule, never go outside the experience of your people. Uh, Nazis are actually outside the experience of, of the people here, so he's not following the rule, strangely. Or he is going, or, you know, he is, and he's intentionally relying on the confusion because uh, Alinsky has a reasons for breaking his own rules, too. Uh, third rule, whenever possible, go outside the experience of the enemy. Hmm, that's an interesting one. Here's what here's, you want to cause confusion, fear, and retreat. This is all off the first page of tactics, by the way. Uh, the next one, fourth rule, make your enemy live up to their own book of rules. Yeah, I know, that's a fun one. Uh, number five, number four, Kyrie's with the fifth rule, ridicule is man's most potent weapon. That's right, that's the reason why we've been throwing shit at one another since we were apes. That's correct. I did not need this book to tell me the truth of this rule, or th that it was a rule at all. Hmm. In fact, I find when... When uh, mockery or ridicule is used on certain groups, they really react badly to it because they think they have the moral prerogative to never ever be mocked. They can't even be mocked. It's like, blast fucking me, you know what I mean? Mad cow theism, mad cow theism. Anyway, uh, uh, da, 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 da. sixth rule, a good, tactic, a good tactic is one that your people enjoy, like mad cow theism. Seventh rule, a tactic that drags on too long becomes a drag. Uh, for example, labeling everything that you don't like Nazis. That's, that's dragging on a little too long. 80 years, in fact. 
Now, grant you, I can, I can understand why in some cases neo-Nazis are real, very real thing, but I don't think what he was saying in the original post is the actual issue. I think what's happening is there's probably some political motion inside the Canadian military against what the federal government is trying to do, probably due to the effect of our relationship with the Aga fucking Khan, but I might be wrong about that. I doubt it, but I think that it's... I think that this is probably worth a, a, a thought or two, that the Aga Khan has more to do with this white nationalism post and talking about Nazis than anything else. Uh, eighth rule, keep the pressure on with different taxes, tactics and actions. Utilize all events of the period for your purpose. That means that everything must be on message. So yeah, Sololinsky fail once more. Uh, ninth rule, the threat is usually more terrifying than the thing itself. I linked that immediately this morning as one of the prime examples of where uh, this is projection being used as a weapon against uh, the public who in fact are being scaremongered into acting or believing a certain thing and not given any kind of constructive way out of it. So yeah, the threat is usually more terrifying than the thing itself. Indeed, indeed. The tenth rule, the major premise for tactics is the, develop, in the, is the development of operations that will maintain a constant pressure on the opposition. And this unceasing pressure that results in the reactions from the opposition that are, it, it is this unceasing pressure, results in the reactions from the opposition that are essential for the success of the campaign. As such, he's admitting that unless the, unless the opposition does all the work, nothing will happen. It should be remembered not only the action is that not only that the action is in reaction is the reaction, but that the action is in itself the consequence of the reaction and the, of reaction to the reaction ad infinitum. Shilogism, shilogism, and uh, the pressure produces reacts. Blah blah blah. Eleventh rule. I linked this one also this morning. If you push a negative hard and deep enough, it will break through to its counterside. This is based on the principle that every positive has its negative. We've already seen in the conversion of the negative into the positive in Mahatma Gandhi's development of the tactic of passive resistance. That is an interesting point, but uh, note A in, in this one, if you push A negative, that's the indefinite article. That, that, that could be your own fault, this negative that you're pushing. It doesn't have to be the, the negative of the enemy that you're pushing. Or the thing that is the weakness in them. No, no, no. You can push your own negative, pretend it's their negative, and it will work just as well. Wedges are wedges are wedges are wedges. In a fight, almost anything goes. Yeah, yep. You got that right. Twelfth rule. The price of a successful attack is a constructive alternative. Notice we had no constructive alternative offers to us this morning. I wouldn't call this anything other than a hit piece against Canadian military because a few of its members happen to uh, do this, that, or the other thing, and we're not even sure what it is they're doing. Where's the proof? Where's the proof? Is it coming from CBC only? Because, you know, the liberals like to lie. The liberals lie just as bad as the conservatives ever did, and they're sucking the same dicks. Speaking of which, the 13th rule... Thirteenth rule. There's one, not one that I linked this morning, although I did mention that it has a uh, it it has a use. Projection is also in this last rule. Pick the target first. Freeze it, which is his term. He explains what he means by freeze. First, you have to stop it from moving. You have to somehow stop it from. It's hard to hit a moving target. Is what he means. Personalize it whatever that means, personalize it, either take it personally or make it personally, again, <coughs> projection, and then polarize it. That's the reason why he picked the word Nazi, because it polarizes people, polarizes them immediately, as supposed to, or unless, of course, in any kind of uh, maybe academic situation or maybe even general situation, it tends to turn a lot of people's heads off because they realize hyperbole is hyperbole. You can thank the hysteria channel for the fact that Nazis is as popular as it is, as well as Solowinski. So, uh, that's off this particular chapter. I'll also mention, then you freeze the target, you disregard arguments. I'll go back just a little bit. The should be borne in mind the target is always trying to shift responsibility to get out of being the target. There's a constant squirming and moving and strategy, purposeful and malicious at times, at times just 
for straight survival on the part of the designated target. The forces for change must keep this in mind and pin that target down securely. If an organization permits responsibility to be diffused and distributed in a number of areas, attack becomes impossible. Now, imagine, imagine. Yeah, that's freezing. Freezing means to pick one target. Gee, that's something like we saw in the fucking, what was it called? The Handmaid's Tale, right? Well, you know, oh, wow. Um, let's see what else we're going to read here. One of the criteria in picking your target is the target's vulnerability. Is picking because of vulnerability. Where do you have the power to start? Furthermore, any target can always say, why do you center on me when there are others to blame as well? When you freeze the target, you disregard all these arguments and, for the moment, all the others to blame. Then, as you zero in and freeze your target and carry out your attack, all the others will come out of the woodwork very soon. All of those others. They will become visible by their support of the target. Of course, of course. The target must always be totally indefensible is what they mean, which is why you pick Nazis. With, the fo with this focus comes a polarization. As we've indicated before, all issues must be polarized if actions to follow. The classic statement on polarization comes from Christ. Of course he has to use fucking Christ. Why wouldn't he have to use fucking Christ? Oh, fucking Christ. J uh, Luke eleven twenty three specifically. He that is not against me, or not with me, is against me. Um, I actually made a note on this this morning when I was reading it because, Jesus, I recognized that right away. God, I wonder why, right? Uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. Yeah, this is, um, this is, of course, Jesus bringing in his sword because Jesus always has a sword. He, Jesus, is, uh, Jesus actually says in another place in the Gospels, hey, I, I don't come to bring peace, I come to bring a sword. Well, that's the sword. <laughs> he, is allowed no middle, he allowed no middle ground in the muddy changes on the temples. Blah, blah, blah. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the basis of why I've been saying, first and foremost, that this is Saul Alinsky. Uh, 101 and, and easily so but then I got to looking at some other interesting things as a consequence of this whole study of Saul Alinsky for example as I was reading the first few chapters I noticed that uh, he characterized the Spanish Civil War by a uh, a credo he says it's a credo in the very first page but uh, he doesn't mention it, anything at all about the fact that they were organized as an anarchy First and foremost, I mean to say there was no leadership. They had to, there was no rank and file amongst even the organized milits, militias. So the people's armies, even though they had officers, the officers weren't paid better and the officers had to explain themselves to their own men. But that's not uh, memorial, memorialized in this Spanish Civil War credo. I mean, it kind of is, but it's, it's on an individual level. Better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. Well, that's, that is kind of true. If this means revolution, and that's exactly what they shut down happening was revolution. Second page, this book will not contain any panacea or dogma. I detest and fear dogma. Fear. He fears dogma? Hmm. Wow, that's an interesting word. Very, very telling. Number three on the very first page, on the second page actually, uh, Niels Bohr, the great atomic physicist, he mentions Niels Bohr maybe five or six times throughout the book because he needs quantum physics to give him a justification for something that he can metaphorically refer to even though it doesn't necessarily prove his point. I think his point is specifically that we can't be too uh, objectively certain about anything. We must use probabilities instead. So he uses probabilities to his, in, to his benefit by, su by suggesting a lot of hypotheses which have false premises. Therefore, any probabilities he derives from them are bullshit. <laughs> that's not my fault uh, da, 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 da. the next thing I've marked here that uh, chapter 1 page 7 the radicals must be sensitized what is it? must be sensitive to be trapped or Oh, yeah, it's on page six and seven here. It's, it's been marked by somebody else. Res Radicals must be resilient, adaptable to shifting political circumstances, and sensitive enough to the process of action and reaction to avoid being trapped by their own tactics and forced to travel a road 
not of their choosing. I'm saying this very, 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 very slowly for important points because it's important. Shouldn't ignore that one. I think that to admit something on the sly is a subconscious truth in that one. Here I propose to present an arrangement of certain facts and general concepts of change, a step towards the science of revolution. All societies discourage and penalize ideas in writing that threaten the ruling status quo. It's understandable, therefore, the literature of a half society is a veritable desert when we look on so writings of social change. Oh, well, this is all interesting. Uh, exercise a degree of flow of control over events. Where That's also on this one here. Oh, yeah, that was on the first, the first quote. Next thing I've marked here, page 10. My aim here is to suggest how to organize for power, how to get it and how to use it. So frankly, his motivation is written clear on the page. I will argue the failure to use power for a more equitable distribution of the means of life for all people signals the end of a revolution and the start of a counter-revolution. Well, that's interesting. We get to another interesting part in the first chapter, class distinctions, page 18 in the, ver the version I've got here, the trinity of class distinctions. Uh, I find it bullshit, more or less, that he puts as much emphasis on the middle class and, for, and actually that he didn't seem to see that the vanishing middle class was going to be the issue. That, and I don't think that anyone who reads the book now gets that either because it hasn't been updated to, to reflect that. It is more than anything a middle class guilt trip. We actually get that uh, written large, like written explicitly on page twenty, like the page after this section begins. Um, just as a clash of interest in the okay, but what are the classes? One is the haves, one is the have nots, and then there's the have a little, want more, the middle class. So just as the clash of interest within the have a little want more as has bred so many of the great leaders it also sp spawned a particular breed stalemated by cross interests into inaction those do nothings profess a commitment to social change and ideals of justice equality and opportunity then abstain from and discourage all effective action for change they're known by their brand i agree with your ends but not your means so in a sense i might be one of those group i might i might be one of those group because i do not agree with the means of this particular word being used to prove a point because I don't think it does it very well however shall we continue they function as blankets whenever possible smothering sparks of dissension that promise to flare up into fires of inaction oh sorry flare up in the fires of action those do these do nothings appear publicly as good men humanitarian concerned with justice and dignity and practice their invidious they're the ones Edmund Burke referred to as to refer to when he said acidly, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Both the revolutionary leaders or the doers and the do-nothings will be examined in this page. So indeed, I think this is a guilt trip being laid on the middle class uh, as do-nothings. When in fact, some of the do-nothings are the ones who are engaging in the uh, ideological propaganda battle, which has largely been defined by global corporate interests and nothing else which is awful funny that they want to find Nazis everywhere when you know the corporate corporate fascism doesn't bother them at all Cor corporate fascism they're cool with it right <laughs> Jesus, as long as we got their freaking Starbucks who gives a shit to uh, page 21 Alinsky uh, Oh yes, Alinsky loves fiction uh, for his, for the myth making, uh, for its, as the the thing which creates myths and also allows them to continue. So throughout the entirety of this text, uh, even though there's footnotes, there's no footnotes to anyone else's writing, other than letters and correspondence from particular like key uh, members of the American Revolution, perhaps Alexander Hamilton, maybe or jo Jefferson or someone like that might be listed in here, unless it be. Uh, references to popular fiction and perhaps even um, and perhaps even something else I gotta stop oh let's go again rolling again yep 
Uh, for, okay, myth. He uses he uses whatever fiction he can use because he recognizes that fiction is going to be easier to sell to people than truth. <laughs> so uh, he uses a section from Alice in Wonderland here. Uh, that's what I've actually made a note of. In the same page, though, on page 21, a word about my personal philosophy. It is anchored in optimism. He's an optimist, I've made a note of, but his uh, mountain has no top. So it's a cynical failure. Cynical fail, literally. He's a cynist. He's a cynist. He's a cynic, sorry. He says that he's an optimist, but I think that's an admission that he isn't. He isn't an optimist. He's a cynic. He, the book's called Rules for Realistic Radicals. Pragmatic primer for realistic radicals, and he calls himself an optimist? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Sure, sure, sure. Previous pages, uh, quantum physics is Alinsky's proof, uh, metaphor by analogy. If he doesn't refer to some fiction like the Bible or Alice in Wonderland, he's referring to quantum physics. I don't think that it's fiction like... Um, Alice in Wonderland is, and I don't think it's fiction at all, actually, what Niels Bohr was saying, but I also don't think that what Bohr was saying proves Alinsky's point. So, there is that. On page 23, the fact is that it's not man's better nature, quote-unquote, but his self-interest that demands that he be his brother's keeper. That's an interesting admission by Alinsky at the end of that first uh, chapter. Then follows a chapter on the on means and ends. Oh yeah, the low road to, mor to morality, have not. He mentions this in other places of the book. Means, to, means and ends, uh, page 25 in action. Yeah, I've made a note of this part too. Practical revolutionary understanding, Goethe's conscious is the virtue of observers, not of agents of action. In action, one does not always enjoy the luxury of a decision that is consistent both one's individual conscience and the good of mankind. <laughs> the choice must always be for the latter. Action is for mass salvation and not for the individual's. Action is for mass salvation and not for the individual's personal salvation. He who sacrifices a mass good for his personal conscience as a peculiar conception of personal salvation. He doesn't care enough for the people to be corrupted for them. I, I actually think he's having an argument a little bit there with Nietzsche. He uses Nietzsche as a source though later. Uh, on this same page, or on the page later. Uh, the means and end moralists and non-doers always wind up by their wind up on their ends without any means. On the very following page. These non-doers were the ones who chose not to fight the Nazis in the only way they could have been fought. They were the ones who withdrew, who drew the window blinds to shut out the shameful spectacle of Jews and political prisoners being dragged through the streets. This is not the first use of Nazis to guilt others into um, action by bullshit association. Uh, I found it interesting, actually, that Alinsky, throughout the course of the text, refers to Nazis and to fascism in two different ways, two different contexts, and consistently. So I did a count. I actually did a tally of the entirety of the book. I count, went through the entire page by page and made reference of the number of times the words Nazi or Hitler appeared on the page. It's 19 times, I maybe 20. After about a third of the book, he stops doing that and he makes a, a, a causal link between the actions of the Pentagon or the American War Department before... Um, before Germany was defeated or the Axis powers were defeated and then after they were because the same countries that the America uh, that Americans were fighting uh, on allied with Russia Germany Italy Japan they ended up being allies with Germany Italy Japan against Russia so in a way he's trying to say something about Nazis I think so yeah there's 19 references to Nazis early in the book there's two on the egregious list one was on page 67 Although that's not exactly a terrible one. Uh, uh, it's not really terrible. And then there's a really egregious one on page 177 of the text that I've got. Uh, I don't need, think I really need to go over both of them. But they trust. I mean, you can trust me if you want to or not. I think those two of those 19 were egregious. They were definitely not needed. The rest of them, however, were in context only of Germany or the period 1930 onwards. 
until about 1945 or 60, 1950. At the very latest, Nuremberg is the, like, the extent of where he cuts it off. Interestingly, though, the term fascist appears four times in the book. And of those four times, I would think three of the four with the fascist pig also attached. A pig is also a part of the term. And he uses this to indicate the source of the community. Like, the source, the community which uses it. When fascist pig language enters into Alinsky's language, he, he picked it up from his work with African American communities throughout the um, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Or at least that's his story and he's sticking to it. Which I found very, very interesting. I found very interesting. No lie. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, also in this chapter of means and ends, strangely though, there's a, an echo between this chapter and the chapter tactics. In means and ends, he presents a series of rules pertaining to ethics of means and ends. He does this early in the book. First, that one's concern with ethics of means and ends varies inversely with one's personal interest on the issue, and then has a parallel or a corollary, that one's concern with eth the ethics of means and ends varies inversely with one's distance from the scene of the conflict. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right to me. Two, the second rule of ethics of means and ends is that the judgment of the ethics of means is dependent upon the political position of those sitting in judgment. So then follows this, if you, um, if you actively opposed the Nazi occupation and joined the underground resistance, if you did, I mean, who in 1970 would have done that? Anybody? Anybody at all? Anybody living? Anybody in America? Anybody in a university? Anybody, any of you? Any of you ever um, joined the underground resistance? Then you adopted the means of assassination, terror, property destruction, property uh, bombing of tunnels and trains, kidnapping, and the willingness to sacrifice innocent hostages to the end of defeating the Nazis. Those who opposed the Nazi conquerors, this is, this is three or four of those references we just talked about, who opposed Nazi conquerors regarded the resistance as a secret army of selfless patriotic idealists, courageous beyond expectation and willing to sacrifice their lives to their moral convictions. To... To the occupation authorities, however, these people were lawless, terrorists, murderers, saboteurs, assassins, believed that the ends justified the means were utterly unethical according to the mystical rules of war. <laughs> Any foreign occupation would be so ethically, would so ethically judge its own opposition. However, in such conflict, neither protagonist is concerned with any value except the victory. It's life or death. Next rule, third rule of ethics and means is that the in war, the end justifies almost any means. So if you can get it classified as a war, you're, you're winning, which is why we're talking about war in this bloody post. Or we're actually not talking about war in this post because, you know, I think the actual issue is, like I said earlier, the Aga Khan is very likely one of the triggers which caused Nazis to pop up in this post. Number two, for some reason or another, we're not talking about NATO. Is this a group of people saying, let's get out of NATO? Is this, is this group of organizers or, or skinheads in the Canadian military, are they the ones who think that we should be out of NATO, perhaps? Is it possible they don't, they don't like NATO anymore? Is it possible? Because we're not seeing anything about their... We're not seeing anything about their positions at all. We're only hearing them characterized badly by some idiot on the internet. Winston Churchill's remarks to his private secretary, this goes with number three, uh, a few hours before the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, graphically pointed to the politics of means and ends in war. Informed of the intimate turn of events, Secretary Quartet of Churchill, the leading British anti-communist, could reconcile himself with being on the same side as the Soviets. Would not Churchill find it embarrassing and difficult to ask his government to support the communists? Churchill's reply was clear and unequivocal. Not at all. I've only one purpose. The destruction of Hitler and my life is much simplified thereby. If Hitler invaded hell, I would make at least a favorable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. <laughs> so, that's number three. Number four, the fourth rule of the ethics of means and ends is that judgment must be made in the context of the times in which the action occurred and not from any other chronological vantage point. I would submit to you that in violation of Alinsky's rules for radicals, this man has a problem with Nazis. 
seems to me that this there's a real good reason why he's violating the rule there. Real good reason, because Alinsky wants him to, and so do the organizers. Fifth rule of ethics of means and ends. Oh, wait, 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 wait. For exception. Those who would be critical of the ethics of Lincoln's reversal of positions, this is coming from the same fourth rule discussion, uh, would have a strangely unreal picture of a static, unchanging world where one remains firm and committed to certain so-called principles and positions, like, you know, not killing people who don't got it coming, perhaps, or... Or, yeah, someone doesn't threaten or doesn't kill you, you shouldn't kill them first pretending that they killed you or something. They would have killed us. Yeah, with their words or their laughter. Which one would it have been? To be consistent, this is an interesting thing. Page 31, second chapter. In the politics of human life, consistency is not a virtue. To be consistent means, according to the Oxford Universal Dictionary, standing still or not moving. Men must change with the times or die. See, consistency doesn't mean only that. There is other uses for the word consistency. For example, if a solution, or let's say a solution fairly viscous in its nature, made up of more than one like, component part, which has been introduced to one another, if it isn't stirred to consistency, it may even separate into two fractions entirely different from one another that aren't consistent. It could be mixed together to consistency. See? There's a bit of, a bit of foolishness of being applied in Mr. Alinsky's thinking. He isn't being very clear, I don't think. I think he's being intentionally obtuse in some ways and changing the definitions of specific words to suit another need. Fifth rule of the ethics of means and ends is that concern with ethics increases with the number of means available and vice versa. Concerns with ethics increases with the number of means available. That's right. That's why we're having this discussion on the internet as a starter. To the man of action, the first criterion in determining which means to employ is to access which means are available. To the man of action. Alinsky actually has a problem with the word man. But hey, don't, uh, don't trust this non-feminist. Oh, oh I, I laugh on the, the other side here. Uh, this... Um, to me, ethics is doing, this is Alinsky explaining himself. To me, ethics is doing what is best for the most, which is Jeremy Bentham. Is that utilitarianism? Something like that. During, a, or or is it like, uh, uh, what's his name? That German guy, Kant. Is it Kant's altruism? Is it one or the other? During a conflict with a major corp, I was confronted with a threat of public exposure of a photograph of a motel, Mr. and Mrs. Registration, and photographs of my girl and myself. I say to go ahead and give it to the press. Think she's beautiful, and I never claim to be Sullivan. Go ahead. And that ended the threat. Almost on the heels of this encounter, one of the corporation's minor executives came to see me. Turned out that he was a secret sympathizer with our side. Pointing to his briefcase, he says... In there is plenty of proof of that so-and-so, a leader of the opposition, prefers boys to girls. And I say, thanks, but forget it. I don't fight that way. I don't want to see it. Goodbye. He protested. But they just tried to hang you on that girl. I replied, the fact that they fight that way doesn't mean that I have to do it. To me, dragging a person's private life into this muck is loathsome and nauseous. He left. So far, so noble. But if I had been convinced that the only way we could win was to use it, then without any reservations, I would have used it. And then on the side, I've marked a great big margin note, laws, because he is using it. He's using it right now. Even if he doesn't use it specifically, he still uses it. So, yeah. Judgment in context. I, I think I might have missed a single page one here. Oh, Judgment, no, I, I didn't miss that one. I remember hitting on that one. I remember hitting on that one really, really hardly. Number six, six rule of ethics of means and ends is that, it's no less, that the less important the end to, is to be desired, the more one can afford to engage in ethical con evaluation of the means to it. Number seven, the seventh rule of ethics, the means of means and ends, is that generally success or failure is a mighty determinant of ethics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure it is, sure it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, sure. 
It is after the fact. It's called fait accompli in some cases, yeah. Number eight, the rule of eighth rule of ethics and means and ends is that the morality of the means depends upon whether the means is being employed at a time of imminent defeat or imminent victory. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I wonder which of the two we're looking at here when Nazis are being screamed about. I got a feeling it's defeat and it's also projection because it's involving global corporations and their concerns hiding behind things like social justice. So mad cow theism at the very least. The same means employed with victory is seemingly short. Uh, with same v victory seemingly short may be defined as immoral. Whereas if it had been used in desperate circumstances to avert defeat, the question of morality would never arise. In short, ethics are determined by one whether one's losing or winning. From the beginning of time, killing has always been regarded as justifiable if committed in self-defense. Of um, if committed in self-defense, and then on the side of Martin, a little note here. This is the justification for. Uh, look, Nazi, punch a Nazi. That's where it comes from. It's exactly where it comes from. Ninth rule of the ethics of means and ends is that any effective means of uh, automatically judging, any effective means is automatically judged by the opposition as being unethical. Number nine, the, um, that's projection. Look at that. Number nine is projection on two lists of his ethics. The ninth rule of the ethics of means and ends is that any effect of means is automatically judged by the opposition as being unethical, which includes us. That's how it works. When it's effective and we don't like that it's effective, we call it unethical. We want to insist that it's unethical. What else do you think is going to get Trump impeached as if that's going to happen? As if that was going to happen. <laughs> how do you, give me an A. Give me a U. Give me a D, give me an I, give me a T. What's that spell? And then the mainstream media sits back and goes, Putin, Putin, it spells Putin. Don't look at our tax accounts. Don't look at our bank. Uh, this is true for his side as well. The fact that uh, anything that the enemy does correctly or, or the enemy does that might be right, that might be good, it's got to be judged as unethical or somehow morally repugnant, evil even. Number 10, 10th tenth rule of the ethics of means and ends is that you do what you can with what you have and clothe it, clothe it with moral garments like a Nazi uniform. I'm not saying that it's moral. I'm being sarcastic. I'm being sarcastic. I'm being sarcastic because the uniform is in the idiot's minds and they yell Nazi and point and then expect to get everybody to behave in a unified fascistic way by pointing and ordering like that. And by using the fear of words, don't get labeled a Nazi, it'd be worse than being labeled a Jew, you know? Ah, oh, goodness gracious. Such idiocy. Such idiocy. It's enough to really fucking smack in the teeth. Pages and pages later. Uh, page 44. We have examples are everywhere. Uh, it, all effective actions require the power of passport of morality. We're really still in the same argument there. In his social contract, Rousseau notes the obvious, that law is a very good thing for men with property and very bad thing for men without property. Notice Rousseau doesn't talk about money. He talks about property. And uh, I, I also noticed that uh, Dick Face Alinsky here, he avoids Proudhon altogether, who also talks about property, not money. Funny that Alinsky takes us back to a point of time that's even prior to the 19th century. What a schmuck. Eleventh rule of the ethics of means and ends is that goals must be fr phrased in general terms like liberty, equality, fraternity, of the common welfare, pursuit of happiness, and bread and peace. Whitman put it, a goal once named cannot be countermanded. In this connection, must be remembered that history is made up of actions in which one end results um, in, w in which one end results in another ends in another ends. There's specific, repeatedly scientific discoveries have resulted from experimental research committed to ends or objectives that have little relationship with the discovery. Work on seemingly 
minor practical program has resulted in feedbacks of major creative basic ideas. J.C. Flugel notes in Man, Morals, and Society that in psychology, too, we have no right to be astonished if, when dealing with a means, in exemplia gratia, the cure of a neurotic symptom, the discovery of a more effective way of learning, of the relief of industrial fatigue, we find that we have modified our attitude toward the end acquired some new insight into the nature of mental health, the role of education, the place of work in human life. Uh, or you could call that a conflict of interest, perhaps. So the discussion on means and ends is, is very interesting. There follows after this means and ends chapter, a chapter on merely words, words which are going to be used in more than one context in which he knows he's going to have a problem with. Words like power, uh, I think his de his definition of power being number one on his list is at least fairly honest, but um, we'll get to that again later. He uses Nietzsche in this first chapter, or this, this chapter on his first word. Power is the right word, just as self-interest, compromise, and other simple political words are for, are for they were conceived in and have become part of the politics from the beginning of time. To pander upon, or to those who have no stomach for straight language. To pander to those who have no stomach for straight language. Yeah, tell me about it. I insist upon bland, non-controversial sauces is a waste of time. They cannot deliberately and will not understand what we're discussing here. I uh, agree with Nietzsche's statement in the genealogy of morals on this point. Why stroke the hypersensitive ears of our modern weaklings? Why yield even a single step to the tartuffery of words? For us psychologists, that would involve a tartuffery of action. For a psychologist today shows his good taste, others may say his integrity. In this and if in anything... That he, that he resists the shamefully moralizing manner of speaking which makes all modern judgments about men and things slimy. And then uh, he says, um, Alinsky says in response, we approach a critical point when our tongues trap our minds. And then I've got a written a little arrow pointing up to the dichotomy between the word of philology and psychology. Because Nietzsche was really, really concerned with philology, not so much with psychology. Although I manage, it's, imagine that uh, words are really important to the propagandists too. Uh, Alexander Hamilton is indeed quoted in block here. Self-interest, page 53. Oh, 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 at the end of the power, the description of power. I don't know if he was being sarcastic here or being humorous because he recognizes a role for both. In short, life without power is death. A world without power would be a ghostly wasteland, a dead planet. Oh, really? What if power is a social construct, dick? Um, Self-interest has a black shroud of negativism. He's trying to describe how it's viewed from a certain point of view when he says that. He has an interesting criticism of Machiavelli in this thing. I'll give him that. Oh, uh, page 55 in the self-interest. For example, the U.S. in World War II fervently allied with Russia against Germany, Japan, and Italy, and shortly after victory, fervently allied in its, with its former enemies, Germany, Japan, and Italy, against this former ally, the USSR. <clears throat> Obvious bait in its second use. That's the second time in the text where that has happened, and what he's trying to do is to show that the Nazis didn't go anywhere. This is the underground understanding which is passed around by word of mouth amongst the people who've been, who've been organized. This is definitely the word that's been passed around. That's why the coin keeps coming up in conversations for no good goddamn reason. Compromise is in here. And it's a very, very short two paragraphs. Ego is in here. All definitions of word, like everything else, are relative. Definition to a major is, a, to a major degree, dependent upon your partisan position. Your leader is always flexible. He has pride in the dignity of his cause. He is unflinching sincere and ingenious tactician fighting the good fight. To the opposition he is unprincipled and go whichever way the wind blows. His arrogance is masked by a fake humility. He is dogmatically stubborn, a hypocrite, unscrupulous, unethical, and of course he'll do anything to win. He is leading the forces of evil. To one side he's a demigod, to the other side a demigod, to the other side he's a demagogue. Accurate uh, to the side in the, in the, in the margin. Accurate represents accurate representation or of opposition or is this funny 
Nowhere is the relativity of the definition more germane to the area of life than the word ego. That might actually be true. That may actually be true. Conflict is another word. It's the next word. Bad word in the general opinion. This is a consequence of two of... Oh, and this one only has one very long paragraph. Education of the organizer is the next chapter. Um, I've made a couple of couple of small notes here. All right. Um, in this chapter, education of an organizer, I've noticed Alinsky descending to even the worst of his enemies' faults. Apparently, he's so concerned with Nazis, but he doesn't mind calling people rats because basically the difference between their goals and ours is that they organized to get rid of four-legged rats and stop there. We organized to get rid of four-legged rats so that we can get on to removing two-legged rats. Funny. Among those who disillusion reject the formalized garbage they learn in school, the odds are heavily against their developing into effective organizers. Anyhow, four-legged and two-legged rats. Thanks, Zelensky. Thanks. Yeah, you're really advancing the argument, dude. You're really advancing it. Page 70. Through his imagination, uh, he's, or he's talking about the qualities of an organizer. I'm not going to go through these, but I did find some of this worth talking about because stupid. Throughout his imagination, or through his imagination, he's constantly moving in on the happenings of others, identifying with them, this is the organizer, and extracting their happenings into his own mental digestive system, and thereby accumulating more experience. It is essential for communication that he know of their experiences. Since one can communicate only through the experiments of the other, it becomes clear that the organizer begins to develop an abnormally large body, period. In the very next, very next paragraph, he learns the local legends, anecdotes, values, idioms. He listens to small talk. He refrains from rhetoric foreign to the local culture. He knows the worn out words like white racist, fascist pig and motherfucker have been so spewed that using them now is within the negative experience of the people serving only to identify the speaker as one of those nuts and turn off any further communication. Page 70. <laughs> Alinsky. Wow. 71. There's a difference between honesty and rude disrespect of another's tradition. The organizer will err far less by being himself than by engaging in professional techniques when the people really know better. P.T. Barnum. P.T. Professional Technique Barnum. I wrote that in the, in the, uh, the margin as well. Next uh, trait is curiosity. Very interesting, this one. Actually, Socrates was an organizer because he's talking about curious people, Socrates, and then I made a note immediately. Archimedes was the far more effective organizer, but he came from Syracuse. <laughs> Irreverence. Uh, under the irreverence section in page 73, he says that an organizer is challenging, insulting, agitating, discrediting, and he stirs unrest. Uh, I'm going to take exception to that. I don't think the organized labor sees agitators as being the same as organizers at all. They know that there's a, a use for agitators. Revolutionaries have more of a use for, for agitators. Yes, I'll give you that. That I will give you. That, that I will give you. He says radicals, though, not, not revolutionaries. He talks about revolutionaries. because He talks about radicals on the cover. Wild, right? False advertising. Imagination. Uh, imagination, yes. I wonder why the organizer needs imagination. As the inevitable partner of a reverence and curiosity, of course. How can one be how, we, how can one be by curious? Oh, sorry. How can one be curious without being imaginative? According to Webster's unabridged, as opposed to wet Webster's or someone else's universal, imagination is the mental synthesis of new ideas from elements experienced separately. <laughs> Broader meaning. A dot 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 broader meaning dot 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 starts with the notion of a mental imagining of things suggested but not previously experienced and thence expands dot 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 to the idea of mental creation and poetic idealization and creative imagination dot 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 so it's, the definition didn't survive is is uh, editorializing to the organizer imagination is not only all this but something deeper <laughs> it's the dynamism that starts and sustains him in this whole life of action as an organizer imagination it ignites and feeds the force that drives them to organize for change. And then in the side, uh, I put down 
i.e. propaganda needs imaginations also fascination it needs both imagination and then fascination that's why propaganda works that's how it works both why and how see we don't need to know the purpose or the cause to know the why funny I, I just I just disputed this entire fucking text in that little doesn't speak well for it time when I believed the basic quality that an organizer needed was a deep sense of anger against injustice and that was the prime motivation to keep him going now I know that it's something else this abnormal imagination that sweeps him into a close identification with mankind and projects him into its plight because he wasn't already there why did he have to project anything funny right this projection he's talking about is mental reflection being projected out later because he's a fucking propagandist sorry guys projection win 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 you want to play fucking soccer I can probably do a bicycle kick off your head you know scaremongering is what this is scaremongering sense of humor back to Webster's unabridged sense of humor uh, enables him to ma maintain his perspective and sees him for what he really is a bit of dust that burns for a fleeting section um, I found this funny then down a little bit farther a bit of blurred vision a bit of blurred vision of a better world da -da 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 -da. much of the organizer's daily work is detailed repetitive deadly and monotony it's the totality of things he's engaged in one small bit in, in one small bit as though the artist sees as, as though as an artist he's painting a tiny leaf it's inevitable sooner or later to react with, what am I doing spending my whole life just painting one little leaf? What in the hell? The hell with it, I quit. What keeps him going is this blurred vision of a great mural where other artists, organizers, are painting their bits and each piece is essential to the total. You know who else was a painter? <laughs> oh, that's just too easy, right? You know who else was a painter? Organizing personality. Yes, the very next line after that little joke is an organizing personality. An organizer must be well organized himself so he can be comfortable in a disorganized situation, irrational in a sea of irrationals. Yes, irrationalities. Yes, I bet. Um, we're getting down to the really, really important stuff here. Page 78, a well-integrated well organizer must be a well-integrated political schizoid. Must be a political schizoid. The organizer must become schizoid politically in order to not slip into becoming a true believer. Mad cow theism. <clears throat> before men can act, uh, before men can act, an issue must be polarized. Look, Nazis, punch them. <laughs> See, simple. Page 93 next. Oh, ego's on page 79. I've got some real cool notes here. Page 93. So there's two discussions of resentment in the book. One is starts at this page and then it follows again later in another chapter. I'm not going to reference it right away, but suffice it to say it involves the plight of a group of groups of uh, Canadian Aboriginals. In the second time around first time while an organizer proceeds in the basis of questions the community leader leaders always regard his judgment above their own they believe that he knows his job the organizer knows that even if they feel that way consciously if he starts issuing orders and explaining quote unquote it would be it would begin to build up a subconscious resentment a feeling that the organizer is putting them down. It's not respecting their dignity as individuals. The organizer knows that this is a human characteristic. There's some, someone who asks for help and then gets it, reacts not only with gratitude, but with a subconscious hostility towards the one that helped them. I'm, I'm putting into the, the, on the side here, bullshit. This is actually bullshit. Uh, resentment from explanation in this case is actually bogus. If the explanation educates. It's not, it's not true, or it's true with what he's saying. If the information that the explanation provides is false. That's the problem. Resentment's not felt when someone explains properly. That's one of the genius parts of it. It really is.
I'm going to get ready to skip now because we're, we've got down to the nitty gritty. Page 103, most interesting thing in this book, as far as I'm concerned, I, I've, I've had a hardest, the hardest laugh over this one. Uh, page 103 in the chapter, in the beginning, he's talking about how he started himself. He's, using, he's drawing from his own life experiences and the life experience of other people in order to be able to write what, what it looks like in the beginning when you're just starting out as an organizer. The organizer's job is to inseminate an invitation for himself. There's an interesting thing. Who, who teaches you how to do that, eh? To agitate, introduce ideas, and get people pregnant with hope and a desire for change and to identify you as the person most qualified for the purpose. That's right. The dick, the organizer. Thank you very much. We'll see you after the fucking snippety snip snip. Lots of things in this chapter, actually, rationalization. Rationalization is the part where it talks about um, Canadian Aboriginals, or at least he uses Canadian Aboriginals without citing any specific sources uh, as his means of explaining why it is that we have to um, meet people where they are, not speak outside of their experience, and also be damn genuine when dealing with them. Otherwise, it's pointless. Otherwise, you lose all you... you otherwise, you do get resented. So, in that sense, see what I mean? I get his resentment point. I really do. We get on page 115. There is no such animal as a disorganized community. This is a contradiction of terms that uses two words, disorganization and community, together. The word community itself means an organized communal life, people living in an organized fashion. Uh, immediately above that, I've already marked this. No, this is not the truth. Community means also interdependent. Community is another way of saying exchange, not necessarily organization. doesn't imply anything about organization. But that's, you know... Somebody wants to see community everywhere or wants to see organization everywhere, you know, because he's an organizer, not an agitator. Therefore, if your function is to attack apathy and get people to participate, it is necessary to attack the prevailing patterns of organized living in the community. Ha 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 ha! Ha ha! Now, why do people not follow Saul Alinsky's rules for radicals? There's the reason. The disruption of the present organization is the first step towards community organization. The disruption of the present is the first step. Uh -huh -huh. Present arrangements must be disorganized if they're to be displaced by new patterns to provide the opportunities and means for citizen participation. All change means disorganization of the old and organization of the new. <laughs> Lols. Catch 22, catch 22 follows. This is why the organizer is immediately confronted with conflict. <laughs> The organizer, the organizer dedicated to changing the life of a particular community must first rub raw the resentments of the people in the community, fan the latent hostilities of many of the people to the point of overt expression. So yeah, guess who's to blame for this problem with uh, doing one thing and then doing another, or like working against the cross purposes even with your own mental constructs? Alinsky. Alinsky's entirely to blame for this. This is not the Nazis' fault. But more on this point later. Yeah. Hmm. Let's see, page 119 here. Uh, no one can negotiate without the power to compel negotiation. In, a, in short, the devil must be paid his due. So the, I'll give you the full context of that quote. So the labor organizer simultaneously breeds conflict and builds a power structure. The war between the trade union and management is resolved either through the strike or a negotiation. I kind of agree with that. Either method involves the use of power, economic power to strike, or the threat of it, which results in successful negotiations. No one can negotiate without the power to compel negotiations. And people who yell Nazi aren't interested in fucking negotiating. They're not interested in striking either, strangely. Funny, hey? Unless they want to punch somebody and then they're going to call that a strike? No. Not going to work. Page 120. When is a community not a community? To organize a community, you must understand that a highly mobile, in a highly mobile, urbanized society, i.e. in a pretty limited part of the world, the word community means not community, or the word, or the word community means community of interests. It means community of interests, not physical community. Oh, not fizzy, dirty, you know, di dirty, gritty, realistic, pragmatic community. Is that what you mean? Is that what you mean? The exceptions are ethnic ghettos where segregation has resulted in physical communities that coincide with the community of interest or during political campaigns, political districts that are based on geographical demarcation. Right. Yeah, when is a community not a community? When we've been 
fed a bullshit a definition of a community, then it's not a community I would offer to you. Page 127 for the next one. Oh, wait, no. 123 first. It's difficult for people to believe that you really disrespect their dignity. After all, they know very few people, including their own neighbors, who do. But it's equally difficult for you to surrender that little image of God created in our own likeness, which lurks in all of us and tells us we, what we secretly believe we know. That's but what that we secretly, which lurks in all of us and tells us that we secretly believe that we know what's best for the people. Well, that's just weird. That's just weird. Where the hell is that doing there? Yeah, he ends with another quote from fiction in that in the beginning chapter. Uh, page 127 has a footnote. Oh, this is under the tactics. We've already referred to this this one. Everything on this page, I think I've already got. Uh, 127, 133. Oh, zeroing in and freezing your target. And also, yeah, the references to... Yeah, 133, 134 is Jesus. Um, so, um, 136, probably the last note that I'm actually going to pull out of this book, this entire book. Organize, Lewis shouted, and his voice echoed from the beams of the armory. Organize, and he says pointing, pounding the speaking palm until it jumped. Organize, go to Goodyear and tell them that you want some of those stock dividends. Say, so we're not, we're supposed to be partners, are we? Well, we're not, we're enemies. The real action is the enemy's reaction. The enemy properly goaded and guided in his reaction will be your major strength. The enemy properly goaded and guided, i.e. there's no real interest in getting rid of any of this strength. They want it, they just want to be in control of it. Power. Funny, right? This isn't actually the last thing that I'm going to be commenting on because I know that there's at least one more note in here. I'll get to them nice and quick though. 147. Uh, he talks frankly about delivering threats, threats for like public actions, wildcat actions, sitting strikes, and the like. Uh, threats are necessary it must be delivered in advance before that because threats are frequently more terrifying than the action themselves that's one of his rules threat was delivered by the to the authorities through a legitimate and trustworthy channel every organization must have two or three stool pigeons who are trusted by the establishment these stool pigeons are invaluable as trustworthy lines of communication I'm sure they are 149 But let us go deeper into the psyche of this Goliath, the, the Goliath of competition. Another biblical term failure there. 162 for the next one. Oh, wait, uh, I'm going to skip that one. I'll get back to it. 162. I'll come back to that one. 174. In the genesis of the tacti of tactic proxy, i.e. of using the corporate structure and voting blocks and reorganizing the DNC in the 1970s to get the reactions and the consequences we've got in the last, ooh, I don't know, 10, 15 years. One, uh, 174. The effect of foundation proxies would, of course, be marginal since their proxies, like, unlike those of churches, represented no constituencies. Even so, they were not to be dismissed. Other ideas begin to occur. This is a whole new ball, of, uh, whole new ball game for me, and my curiosity sent me scurrying and sniffing at many opportunities in this great Wall Street wonderland. <laughs> I didn't know where I was going, but that was part of the, oh, look at this. This is a beautiful word. Fascination. <laughs> Fascination, friends, is Saul Alinsky's exact value for the word power. Friends, I'm telling you. Page 176. Fascination and nothing else. He doesn't care about anything else. He doesn't really care about property. All Just fascination is all you need. Recently, I was at a luncheon on page 176. This follows straightly after this other one. I was at a luncheon meeting with a number of presidents of major corps when one of them expressed his fear that I saw things only in terms of power rather than from the point of view of goodwill and reason. 
I replied that when he and his corporation approached other corporations in terms of reason, goodwill, and cooperation, instead of going for the jugular, that would be the day I was happy to pursue the conversation. The subject was dropped. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to lols out loud for that one. <laughs> he sounds a lot like another you know, historical person in power. He really does, because he's willing to sit down with the corporate structure like that. What's strange is that Alinsky is 120 or 100, like diametrically opposed to the Pentagon, supposedly, because he's constantly ragging on the Pentagon throughout the book, which I can understand. I really can. But it's a little weird. Just a little weird that he ends up coming out so much like some other historically well-known world leaders who had <laughs> were interested in nothing more than power. Oh my. The last chapter, the way ahead, organizing for action will now, organization for action will now and in the decade ahead center upon America's white middle class. That is where the power is. I know a lot of people would be willing to dispute that one now about when more than three-fourths of our people are from both the point of view of economics and of their self-identification are middle class, it's obvious that their action or inaction will determine the direction of change. But he doesn't like the middle class, remember. He doesn't like the middle class because they're half, you know, do-nothings. And he underestimates the size of the lower class. He way underestimates the size of the lower class. So, here comes an admission for radicals on page 191. We are in the uh, ooh, 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 page 191. 189. Oh, wait, it's 189 first. Admissions for radicals. Many of the lower middle class, of the lower middle class, the ones closest to the lower class, are members of labor unions, churches, bowling clubs, fraternal, service, or nationality organizations. They are organizations, they are organizations and people that must be worked with, as one would work with any other part of the population, with respect, understanding, and sympathy. Let's not forget that, eh? But oh yes, national organizations totally where the where the left derives a lot of its power. From national organizations, you know, fascistic things, like the scouts or the girl guides, things like that. You know, get it? People, oh yeah, 191. We are in the age of pollution, progressively burying ourselves in our own waste. Where was the last one here? Oh, it's actually on the page following. It was started on the same page as that... Um, must be worked with understanding and sympathy. People must be reformed so they cannot be deformed into despondency and driven through desperation into dictatorship and the death of freedom. The silent majority now are hurt, bitter, suspicious, feeling rejected and at bay. This sick condition in many ways is an explosive, is as explosive as the current race crisis. Race crisis? Interesting, interesting. Their fears and frustrations are at their helplessness and mounting to the point of political paranoia which can demonize people to turn the law of survival in the, narrow, in, in the narrow sense. On the opposite page, we are in the age of pollution, pollution, progressively burying ourselves in our own waste, which gets me directly back to uh, page 162, which I referenced there a second ago. Uh, get it from the right chapter here. This is in the tactics, I think. Yeah, it is too. Tactic. Speaking of issues, let's look at the issue of pollution. Here again, we can use the haves against the haves, haves against the haves to get what we want. The utilities or heavy heavy industries talk about the people. They mean the banks or other power sectors of the world. They say if we if their banks say start pressing them when they listen and hurt, their target therefore should be the banks that serve the steel, auto, and other industries. So he talks first about the issue of pollution there, right? But earlier in the book, way way back, in fact, in the prologue, in the prologue, and in a footnote essentially because uh, it is the prologue page 23 of the prologue or I found this funny as hell page 23 remember once you organize people around something as commonly agreed upon as pollution then 
and organized people is on the move. I'm wondering where I've got this all marked down to. It's over here. Oh, uh, then an organized people is on the move. From there, it's a short and natural step to political pollution to Pentagon pollution. So from pollution to political pollution to Pentagon pollution, this proves concisely and exactly why climate change is way, 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 way less effective as an argumentative tool than talking about global warming. Because climate change can talk about anything. You don't like the makeup of your, of your, polit of your political climate. You don't like the... Uh, the nature of your economic climate, climate, then, eco then climate change is blamed for all these other things when in fact it has nothing to do with the issue at hand.